The last thing we did before we came out here was check my microphone. So that is, that is amazing that it was turned off. Anyway, thank you. It's so good to be with you all. Um, I truly mean it when I say that this is only my second time in worship with you all, but I consider myself a part of the North Shore extended family. Um, y'all have just been wonderful. You got a great team here and so inspired by the ministries that um, this church is so faithfully leaning into. So Uh, It's really good to be here um, because I am so excited about this timely series that you all are in, looking at how it is that we faithfully, lovingly live into the relationships in our lives. Over the past couple years, we all know that our relationships have taken a hit. Many of us have felt um, the strain in our marriages because of this ongoing pandemic, the unknowns around if our kids will be in school this week or if daycare will be open. I know for me, certain friendships and relationships with extended family that at one point felt sort of simple and straightforward have taken a hit simply because of the cultural divisions and political divisions in our world. And some people in this room are thinking, you know, my relationships with family and friends, they have never been simple or straightforward. And I have a few of those too. But regardless of where your relationships are today, one thing that is true for absolutely every one of us is that our relationships present us with a rich opportunity for growth and transformation in our life with God. There's a great old story written by a guy named Shakespeare. You may have heard of him. Um, But it's about an old and unhappy king named King Lear. And as King Lear has aged, he's become more like impetuous and demanding. The king has three daughters, and at the beginning of the story, one of his daughters makes this really insightful observation about her father. She says this, he hath ever but slenderly known himself. He hath ever but slenderly known himself. In other words, he lacks self-awareness. And as the play unfolds, King Lear's life begins to tragically fall apart. One of his uh, daughters abandons him. The other daughters manipulate him. And if you read this tragedy, you know that at first, King Lear blames everyone else for his problems. But the truth is, the reason for the king's downfall was clearly stated from the start. He didn't see himself. He didn't know himself. He spends his emotional energy critiquing and manipulating others, and he gets to the end of his life only to realize that the biggest problem was not all the people around him. His biggest problem was that he never did the hard and courageous work of looking in the mirror. Now, I trust most of us have healthier relationships than King Lear, but there's deep wisdom in this story that doesn't originate with Shakespeare. In Matthew chapter seven, Jesus is speaking to a crowd of people and here's what he says. He says this, why do you see the splinter that's in your brother's or sister's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? How can you say to your brother or sister, let me take the splinter out of your eye when there's a log in your eye, you deceive yourself. First, take the log out of your eye and then you'll see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's or sister's eye. I. See, Jesus is using exaggerated language here to make the point that deception is never greater than when it comes to looking at our own life. He hath ever but slenderly known himself. And Jesus is saying, when we don't know ourselves well, it spills over into how we see and relate to others. It becomes a significant barrier to intimacy, relationship, community. I'll never forget the very first couple I had the privilege of marrying, we um, like performing their wedding as a pastor. Yeah, important clarification there. Uh, So I got together with this couple and we sat down at a table, you know, we met a few times before the wedding. And um, on this first meeting, I asked them, I said, "Um, so tell me, what is something that you are learning about yourself through this process of engagement? And they kind of sat there and thought for a minute and uh, the woman spoke up first and she said, you know, I'm realizing that when I get stressed about things, like I kind of am getting stressed about this wedding, I can be really unkind and even mean sometimes. 
and we listened empathetically and then the man spoke up and he said, you know, um, same here, I've been learning that when she gets stressed sometimes, she can be really, really mean. <laughs> Now, he sort of said this jokingly, and we all had a good laugh, but I think it captures what is often our fundamental approach to relationships. We are quick to see and name the flaws in the other person and less in tune with our own motivations, our own needs, our own story. How do we respond to Jesus' invitation here and change that? How do we see ourselves with greater clarity? What does that look like, practically speaking? In Jesus' day, the concept of self-awareness was less of a trend, but the idea of knowing oneself was certainly present. See, in the ancient world, uh, the word used to talk about self was the soul. If we were to do sort of a deep dive on scripture, we would find that word 700 times used throughout the Bible. And essentially, it means person or life. Dallas Willard says the soul is what integrates and enlivens everything in the various dimensions of the self. It's the center of human beings. It drives our choices and behavior and ultimately our relationships. And it's helpful to sort of think about this idea of soul in two sort of categories. The first part of the soul is simply our DNA. It's the stuff that we come into the world sort of hardwired with. It's our genetics. But it's not just that. We are not just our DNA. Our soul, our self, has been also shaped in powerful ways by our story, by our life experiences, by um, we all came into this world desiring and needing love and safety. It's core to being human. And from a very young age, depending on our circumstances uh, and the families of origin that we grew up in, we figure out how to act in such a way to receive the safety and the love that our soul craves. I'm reading a great book right now called Anatomy of the Soul by a guy named Kurt Thompson. And he's a, a trained psychiatrist, but also a deeply committed Christian with um, theological training. And in this book, he explores the fascinating connection between neuroscience, spiritual practices, and relationships. And Thompson makes this really important point. He names the reality that before we even have language to talk about it, our brains will register the general level of safety or tranquility or chaos generated by the people, generally our primary caregivers, with whom we are trying to connect. In essence, he says, our minds begin to wire in accordance with our earliest experiences of relationship. We learn how, in our context, to feel safe, and we act accordingly. And while these mental maps, they keep us safe for a time, the problem is, as Scotty unpacked when he kicked off this series, people are imperfect. No one loves us perfectly. Since Adam and Eve broke the initial connection in the garden, no human attempt at relationship will get it right 100% of the time. And this is important because it means our brains have actually wired themselves in the context of this fallen world. Our souls have taken shape in the context of imperfect connection. Our patterns of relating to others have been formed apart from God's original intent. And if we look at the ministry of Jesus and his personal interaction with others, we see he spent a significant amount of time gracefully inviting people to see their own broken soul formation with greater clarity. Practically speaking, this meant inviting folks to look at their life and pay attention to patterns to pay attention to patterns, specifically patterns of relating that their soul had embraced as a way of feeling safe in a broken world. One example of this uh, comes from John chapter four. Many of you will know this story. Jesus and his disciples are traveling from Judea to Galilee, and they take an uncommon route through Samaria. Now, most Jews in that day made a point to avoid Samaria, They'd rather travel the longer way than come into contact with the hated Samaritans. But for some reason, on this trip, on this day, uh, Jesus, who is a Jew, does not want to avoid Samaria. 
His disciples go off to find food and Jesus goes to the well that's located just outside the town. And while he's there, he encounters a Samaritan woman and they strike up a conversation. And at one point, Jesus reveals to her that he has water that will quench her thirst. And the woman is intrigued. Here's what we read next. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have five husbands and the man uh, you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Now, notice what's happening here. The woman asks, where can I get this water? Water that will cause me to experience fullness, contentment, wholeness, the things that we are all wired to crave in this life. And Jesus responds by first inviting her to look more deeply at her own life. He eventually names, you have five husbands and the man you're with now is not your husband. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, there's a pattern here. And this pattern is an indicator about what's happening in your soul. See, as we look to understand ourselves better, Jesus invites us to pay attention to where our soul goes looking in search of safety and security. The Franciscan priest Richard Rohr calls these patterns or mechanisms the loyal soldier because they offer us an illusion of safety and protection. The text doesn't go into great detail here, but given the Samaritan woman's uh, history of relating to men, we can assume that this is where her soul turns for safety and protection. See, self-awareness and growth in our relationships, it begins when we're able to identify those patterns of our own soul. Where do you go? Where do I go? Where do we look for that sense of security and love in this world that has fallen? Often, these aren't simple questions to answer because they run very, very deep within us. They've been wired into our brain. These soul patterns have been with us a long time. One pattern I've become increasingly aware of over the last year is rooted in how I received love as a child. I grew up in a, you know, from, in all respects, a very healthy and safe family. From a young age, I was involved in a lot of activities and athletics and experienced relative success in this area. And as a result, from the time I was probably four or five years old, I heard this dual message. We love you so much and we're so proud of you. We love you so much and we are so proud of you. And somewhere along the way, I conflated those two messages. My soul unconsciously adopted this notion that in order to receive love from others, to receive love from God, I needed to make them proud. And so I lived accordingly. I became very achievement-oriented and performance-driven. As long as I could impress people, I felt safe. For me, achievement became the loyal soldier. It was my protection. But eventually, eventually, I learned what the woman at the well learned, which is my thirst was never quenched. My soul was never at rest. I was always in self-protection mode. And aside from simply being an exhausting way to live, the problem, and this is so important, the problem with the loyal soldier is that it keeps us from living into our calling. We cannot faithfully embrace the calling to love others if we are always in self-protection mode. My husband's name is Sam, and shortly after we were married, our first major fight had to do with a lamp, like a bedside lamp. Um, you see, I, from the time I was a kid, I loved staying up late to read. And often I'd fall asleep without turning the lamp light off. Unfortunately, Sam did not appreciate this sacred habit. Um, Turns out some people like it dark when they sleep. Um, so the first few times this happened, he kindly and patiently sort of brought it up with me. Nonetheless, I continued to fall asleep with the lamp on. So finally one day, Sam came to me. He said, we need to talk about something. Uh, I've asked you to turn the light off before you sleep and it keeps happening and I just don't feel seen or valued. In fact, I feel really frustrated and angry. And this was all it took to trigger this part of my soul that believed because I had failed Sam, even in something 
so ridiculously silly and small. But because I had failed him, I was somehow a failure. That in this moment, he was not proud of me. I was not loved. And this marriage definitely was not going to work. (laughs) See, what resulted, believe it or not, was one of our biggest arguments to date. We still refer to it as the infamous lamp fight. uh, Where poor Sam actually had to say to me, it's not that I don't love you. It's that I really sleep better in the dark. See, as we learn to see these patterns of the soul, we learn to see how they ultimately do not serve us or our relationships well. But first, we must become aware of them. Today or this week, I'd encourage you to reflect on the question, what did my earliest experiences in life teach me about how to feel loved and safe in the world? And where do I see these patterns in my closest relationships? It might be worth asking a trusted friend to kind of reflect on that question with you. What do you notice in me? Where do I go in an attempt to protect my own soul? For some, it might mean disengagement, getting quiet. For others, it might mean feigning indifference because we've tried caring before and it's actually quite risky. Still for others, it might be living always on high alert because growing up, that was your role. You were the one that had to look out for everyone predict and handle the chaos. That's how you stay safe. Now, here is the good news. As we grow in our self-awareness around these patterns, they become for us a doorway to deeper faith. Patterns become a doorway to faith. See, if we return to Jesus' encounter with a Samaritan woman, you'll see that Jesus offers her an alternative to the patterns of soul protection that she's embraced. He tells her this, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In other words, the patterns you've embraced into your story in the name of soul protection, they're insufficient. Let them go, Jesus says, try something else. I recently read a really powerful story about Japanese soldiers who were returning home from um, war following the Second World War. And when the soldiers came home, certain community leaders recognized that they were not ready to turn to peaceful and civil society. Japan is a country that places a high value on symbol and ceremony. And so in an attempt to help these soldiers adjust back to their former lives, they held a ceremony and During the ceremony, an elder from the community went through and thanked each person, each soldier individually. And then one by one, he announced over them, the war is now over. The community needs you to let go of what has served you and us well up to now. We need you to return as a parent, a partner, a friend, a mentor, something beyond a soldier. See, in the gospel story, what we're invited to live is something beyond the soldier, something that will permanently and eternally quench the thirst of our souls. But to get to that something, we must first recognize and release the patterns that we keep falling back on. And time and time again in scripture, this is what happens when people encounter Christ. They experience the relief and the joy of a God who offers them the security and the love that their soul has been craving since day one. They realize, I don't have to protect myself anymore. There's something beyond that. Zacchaeus steps away from patterns of wealth accumulation and deceit. Martha steps away from this perpetual worry and anxiety. Saul, who would later become Paul, steps away from patterns of violence and hate. See, each of these folks in Scripture, they arrive at a particular moment in their story, a crucial moment. They're faced with two ways, the way of the loyal soldier or the way of the safety and love of Jesus Christ, and they choose to put their trust in what Christ offers. The theologian Henry Nouwen articulates this sacred work so well when he writes this, A split between divinity and humanity has taken place within you. With your divinely endowed center, you know God's will, God's love, God's way. But your humanity is cut off from that. 
Your many human needs for affection, attention, and consolation are living apart from your divine sacred space. Your call is to let those two parts of yourself come together again. See, friends, each time we make the choice to actively place our faith in Jesus versus the deeply ingrained patterns, Christ becomes more at home in us. We glimpse what Jesus talked about when he spoke of the full life, the life yoked to him where our burdens feel less and our peace runs deep and there's a spring of water welling up within us. As many of you know, we recently had a big dumping of snow in this part of the world, in the Northwest. And during that week of winter weather, I talked on the phone with my 95-year-old grandma who lives in the area. She grew up on a farm in South Dakota, so she's very familiar with kind of winter weather. And as we were talking on the phone, she was having kind of memories of some of those experiences. And she recalled to me as uh, a teenager, when a snowstorm would come through, she and her siblings would bundle up and head out into the storm. It was their job to rescue the cows. This is because when the storm started, the cows would make their way towards the shelter of the barn, but sometimes they would encounter a hay bale in the field, and in the middle of the storm, they would wrongly assume that the hay bale was the door to the barn. And in worst case scenarios, a cow would freeze to death, standing there, waiting for the door to open. And so my grandma's family would head out to find the cows who'd gotten stuck behind the illusion of safety and lead them to the actual warmth and safety of the barn. See, I love this picture because as we grow in self-awareness and place our faith in Christ, we become increasingly aware of a God who is fully aware of us and loves us entirely without reservation or end. We find in him the very thing our soul has been looking for all along. It's puzzling that Jesus, a Jew, went through Samaria. Why did he do this? He did it to find the woman who was stuck in the storm. It's puzzling that the God of the universe went out of his way to become human with us. Why did he do this? He did it because in a way we were freezing behind the hay bale trying to save our souls and he found us in our storm. And he says, no, follow me. You'll freeze out here. Put your faith elsewhere. And in a way, when we notice the patterns of our loyal soldier at work in our story, when, you know, we're tempted to disengage from our spouse, we're tempted towards anger or performance or overcommitting or gossip or defensiveness, if we can become a people who notice those moments, if we can pause and take a deep breath, we can make the choice to let that soldier go and be at home instead in the one who has found us. And friends, this journey, it's crucial and it's important, but it's not easy. Just this week, I had a meeting to debrief a project that I'd led for our church, and the project went fine. There were parts that went great. There were parts that could have gone better. But because of my loyal soldier, because of my mechanisms, uh, that proving my competence to other people is really important. So receiving feedback has always been a little bit of a struggle. Often in meetings like this, I'll uh, go ahead and list for people all the things that I went poor, think went poorly because it's much easier for me to name them than to try to receive them from someone else. But for this particular meeting, I had this sermon on my mind. I'd been thinking a lot about what it means to grow in self-awareness as a way of deepening our faith. So I walked into that meeting, and I did my very best to choose a different way. I didn't start with a list of everything I thought went poorly. I said, hey, you know, I'd love your thoughts. I'd love your feedback. And then I said a silent prayer. God, I put my faith in the security that you alone offer. And then I listened, and at moments I felt myself getting a bit defensive or feeling a little insecure, and I fell back on that prayer. And I still have a long ways to to go in this journey, but here is the good news. Once we begin to see these patterns and choose faith in the security of Christ, we slowly notice our relationships undergo transformation. Faith 
transforms our relationships. In John chapter four, the story begins with a woman who is all alone. She's come to the well during the hottest hours of the day when she can be sure no one else is around. And again, we don't know the specifics, but it's safe to assume her patterns and choices have led her to this place of relational disconnect with the people around her. And notice as she interacts with Jesus, she chooses to let past patterns go and put her faith in him. Then at the end of the story, she goes back to the town and tells her community about this man, and they listen to her, and they follow her. Notice where there was division and separation and loneliness. Now there are signs of healing, community, relationship. See, the woman shows up differently in relationship with others because of her faith. And friends, the same is true of us, this commitment to self-awareness. It begins by disrupting certain patterns and choosing faith. And as we do this, we realize that what Paul says in 2 Corinthians is true. God's grace is entirely sufficient, entirely secure, entirely safe. And when we live into that truth. We find ourselves free to come into relationships without needing or expecting anyone else to save us. We know that we're saved. We can engage conflict. We can set needed boundaries. We can love people. We can love our enemies. We can parent our children. We can have a hard conversation with a friend. We can show up with vulnerability and humility in our marriage, all from a place of deep and grounded and unshakable security. I love that line from the the ceremony of the soldier. We now need you to return as a parent, a partner, a friend, a mentor, something beyond a soldier. See, when we think about relationships in God's kingdom, this is our invitation to become something beyond the soldier, to live with ever-increasing faith in the one who is sufficient. And then to be a parent, a partner, a friend, a mentor who reflects the life and the way and the goodness of Jesus because, friends, this world needs that. More than ever, this world needs souls transformed in the way of Christ. So as we close today, the invitation is simple but not easy. What's your soldier look like? Where are you still trying to protect your own soul? And what would it look like to make a choice today to see that for what it is, to put your faith in someone else? I'd invite you just, as the band kind of leads us in these next few moments, to get as specific as you can in conversation with God in naming that soldier. Maybe you have no idea. Maybe this concept is entirely new to you. I'd ask that you just pray, God, Show me this week. Help me to be aware, to see the patterns that are not serving me well. And then to be able to step into this fullness of life that God offers in faith. Let's pray together. God, I just think about the relationships in this room that are represented family, friends, spouses, thousands of thousands of connections, all with such life-giving potential. And yet we know it's tricky. We know that relationships are hard. We know that so often we get in our own way. In pursuit of the very safety we long for, Jesus, we hold on to patterns that do not bring life. You alone bring life. God, we invite you, we ask you, meet us in these spaces where we're holding on ever so tightly to old ways. Do a new thing in us. Help us to trust you on new ground. God, in so trusting, may we see in ourselves a security, a deep soul security. May that be a just an incredible blessing to the people in our lives and in this world. Jesus, we we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you call us your children. We thank you that there is just 
more security and safety in that fact alone than we would need in a lifetime. We pray this in Jesus' name.